Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of Shakespeare by Bill Bryson. So this is non-fiction, pretty much a biography on Shakespeare. He does say right at the beginning, actually not that much is known about Shakespeare's life, and we'll come to some bits about that as I go through my tabs. First off, I'm going to read the blurb for you guys, then I'll go through and check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dane reads... World-famous writer Bill Bryson brings us this brilliantly readable biography of our greatest dramatist and poet, William Shakespeare. Examining centuries of myths, half-truths and downright lies, Bill Bryson tries to make sense of the man behind the masterpieces. In a journey through the streets of Shakespeare's time, he brings to life the hubbub of Elizabethan England and a host of characters along the way. Bryson celebrates the glory of Shakespeare's language, his ceaseless inventiveness gave us hundreds of now indispensable phrases, images and words, and delights in details of his fallouts and folios, poetry and plays. Stitching together information from a vast array of sources, he has created a unique celebration of one of the most significant and least understood figures in history, not to mention a classic piece of Bryson. So let's check out some tabs. So this is a little interesting excerpt right at the beginning. So uh, he's talking about how we don't really know what Shakespeare looked like and he says, that leaves us with just one other possible likeness, the painted life-size statue that forms the centerpiece of a wall monument to Shakespeare at Holy Trinity Church in Stratford-upon-Avon where he is buried. Like the Dreschel, it is an indifferent piece of work artistically, but it does have the merit of having been seen and presumably passed as satisfactory by people who knew Shakespeare. It was executed by a mason named Gerhard Janssen and installed in the chancel of the church by 1623, the same year as Dreschel's portrait. Janssen lived and worked near the Globe Theatre in Southwark in London and thus may well have seen Shakespeare in life. Though one rather hopes not, as the Shakespeare he portrays is a puffy-faced, self-satisfied figure with, as Mark Twain memorably put it, the deep, deep, subtle, subtle expression of a bladder. We don't know exactly what the effigy looked like originally, because in 1749, the colours of its paintwork were refreshed by some anonymous but well-meaning soul. 24 years later, the Shakespeare scholar Edward Malone, visiting the church, was horrified to find the bust painted and ordered the church wardens to have it whitewashed, returning it to what he wrongly assumed was its original state. By the time it was repainted again years later, no one had any idea of what colours to apply. The matter is of consequence because the paint gives the portrait not just colour but definition, as much of the detail is not carved on but painted. Under whitewash it must have looked rather like those featureless mannequins once commonly used to display hats in shop windows. I mean, mannequins are still used all the time, right? So here's a great little bit of, um, like a few statistics on Shakespeare which I think are interesting. Faced with a wealth of text but a poverty of context, scholars have focused obsessively on what they can know. They have counted every word he wrote, logged every dib and jot. They can tell us, and have done so, that Shakespeare's works contain 138,198 commas, 26,794 colons, and 15,785 question marks. That ears are spoken of 401 times in his plays, that Dunghill is used 10 times and Dullard twice, that his characters refer to love 2,259 times, but to hate just 183 times, that he used damned 105 times and bloody 226 times, but bloody minded only twice, that he wrote hath 2,069 times, but has just 409 times, that altogether he left us 884,647 words, made up of 31,959 speeches, spread over 118,406 lines. If you're a data geek like me, you're gonna like that info. There's some context into the time he was born, uh, about the plague. The outbreak of 1564 was a vicious one. At least 200 people died in Stratford, about 10 times the normal rate. Even in non-plague years, 16% of infants perished in England. In this year, nearly two thirds did. One neighbour of the Shakespeare's lost four children. In a sense, William Shakespeare's greatest achievement in life wasn't writing Hamlet or the sonnets, but just surviving his first year. And I love this as well, this just tells you how much of a badass Queen Elizabeth I was. Elizabeth was 30 years old and had been queen for just over five years at the time of William Shakespeare's birth, and she would reign for 39 more, although never easily. In Catholic eyes, she was an outlaw and a bastard. She would be bitterly attacked by successive popes who would first excommunicate her and then openly invite her assassination. Moreover, for most of her reign, a Catholic substitute was conspicuously standing by, her cousin, Mary Queen of Scots. Because of the dangers to Elizabeth's life, every precaution was taken to preserve her. She was not permitted to be alone out of doors and was closely guarded within. She was urged to be wary of any presence of clothing designed to be worn against her body bare for fear that they might be deviously contaminated with plague. Even the chair in which she normally sat was suspected at one point of having been dusted with infectious agents. When it was rumoured that an Italian poisoner had joined her court, she had all her Italian servants dismissed. Eventually, trusting no one completely, she slept with an old sword beside her bed. And uh, she was uh, a Protestant and uh, 
So it said, and it says, so being Catholic was not particularly an act of daring in Elizabethan England. Being publicly Catholic, propagandising for Catholicism was another matter, as we shall see. Catholics who did not wish to attend Anglican services could pay a fine. These non-attenders were known as recusants, from a Latin word for refusing, and there were a great many of them, an estimated 50,000 in 1580. Fines for recusancy were only 12 pence until 1581, and in any case were only sporadically imposed, but then they were raised abruptly, and for most people crushingly, to £20 a month. Remarkably, some 200 citizens had both the wealth and the piety to sustain such penalties, which proved an unexpected source of revenue to the crown, raising a very useful £45,000 just at the time of the Spanish Armada. And um, we learn about this as well. I think this is about London Bridge. It says, By long tradition, at the Southwark end of the bridge, the heads of serious criminals, especially traitors, were displayed on poles, each serving as a kind of odd and grisly bird feeder. The rest of the bodies were hung above the entrance gates to the city, or distributed to other cities across the realm. There were so many heads indeed, that it was necessary to employ a keeper of the heads. Shakespeare, arriving in London, was possibly greeted by the heads of two of his own distant kinsmen, John Somerville and Edward Arden, who were executed in 1583 for a fumbling plot to kill the Queen. And here's a note on tobacco. Tobacco, introduced to London the year after Shakespeare's birth, was a luxury at first, but soon gained such widespread popularity that by the end of the century there were no fewer than 7,000 tobacconists in the city. It was employed not only for pleasure, but as a treatment for a broad range of complaints, including venereal disease, migraine, and even bad breath, and was seen as such a reliable prophylactic against plague that even small children were encouraged to use it. For a time, pupils at Eton faced a beating if caught neglecting their tobacco. How times have changed. And um, it says, uh, the Puritans believed that theatres were hotbeds of sodomy, and there uh, we get. There may actually be a little something to this, as popular tales of the day suggest. In one story, a young wife pleads with her husband to be allowed to attend a popular play. Reluctantly, the husband consents, but with the strict proviso that she be vigilant for thieves and keep her purse buried deep within her petticoats. Upon her return home, the wife bursts into tears and confesses that the purse has been stolen. The husband is naturally astounded. Did his wife not feel a hand probing beneath her dress? Oh yes, she responds candidly. She had felt a neighbour's hand there, but I did not think he had come for that. And some interesting stuff here, including the origin of the term box office, um, and the way that rich people collected players. It says, but though plays were tolerated, they were strictly regulated. The master of the revels licensed all dramatic works at a cost of seven shillings per licence, and made sure that companies performed in a manner that he considered respectful and orderly. Those who displeased him could in theory be jailed at his indefinite pleasure, and punishments were not unknown. In 1605, soon after the ascension of James I, Ben Johnson and his collaborators on Eastwood Ho made some excellent but unwisely intemperate joke about the sudden influx of rough and underwashed Scots to the royal court, and were arrested and threatened with having their ears and noses lopped off. It was because of these dangers, and the Vagrancy Act of 1572, which specifically authorised the whipping of unlicensed vagabonds, that acting troops attached themselves to aristocratic patrons. The patron afforded the actors some measure of protection, and they in turn carried his name across the land, lending him publicity and prestige. For a time, patrons collected troops of actors rather in the way rich people of a later age collected racehorses or yachts. Plays were performed at about two o'clock in the afternoon. Handbills were distributed through the streets advertising what was on offer, and citizens were reminded that a play was soon to start with the appearance of a banner waving from the highest part of the structure in which the performance was to take place, and a fanfare of trumpets that could be heard across much of the city. General admission for groundlings, those who stood in the open area around the stage, was a penny. Those who wished to sit paid a penny more, and those who desired a cushion paid another penny on top of that. All this at a time when a day's wage was one shilling, twelve pence, or less. The money was dropped in a box, which was taken to a special room for safekeeping, the box office. And obviously, um, women were played by boys, and it says, What we often know a great deal about performers in male roles from Shakespeare's day, we know almost nothing about the conduct of the female parts. Judith Cook in Women in Shakespeare says she could not find a single record of any role of a woman played by a specific boy actor. We don't even know much about them in general terms, including how old they were. For many of a conservative nature, stage transvestism was a source of real anxiety. The fear was that spectators would be attracted to both the female character and the boy beneath, thus becoming doubly corrupted. This disdain for female actors was a Northern European tradition. In Spain, France and Italy, women were played by women, a fact that astonished British travellers, who seem often to have been genuinely surprised to find that women could play women as competently on stage as in life. 
Shakespeare got maximum effect from the gender confusion by constantly having his female characters, Rosalind in As You Like It, Viola in Twelfth Night, disguise themselves as boys, creating the satisfyingly dizzying situation of a boy playing a woman playing a boy. And here we get a reference to Shakespeare being the Upstart Crow, which is uh, where the TV show Upstart Crow, uh, starring David Mitchell as William Shakespeare, great program, uh, but where that gets its name from. Um, so a guy called Green, what's his first name? Can't find it. Green's Groatsworth of Wit. Only two copies of Green's Groatsworth survive, and there would not be much call for either were it not for a single arresting sentence tucked into one of its many discursive passages. Yes, trust them not, for there is an upstart crow, beautified with our feathers, that with his tiger's heart wrapped in a player's hide, supposes he is well able to bombast out a blank verse as the best of you, and being an absolute Johannes factotum, is in his own conceit the only shake scene in a country. It's talking about Shakespeare's education, it says, he had some command of French, it would seem, and evidently quite a lot of Italian, or someone who could help him with quite a lot of Italian, for Othello and the Merchant of Venice closely followed Italian works that did not exist in English translation at the time he wrote. His vocabulary showed a more than usual interest in medicine, law, military affairs and natural history. He mentions 180 plants and employs 200 legal terms, both large numbers. But in other respects, Shakespeare's knowledge was not all that distinguished. He was routinely guilty of anatopisms, that is, getting one's geography wrong, particularly with regard to Italy, where so many of his plays were set. So, in The Taming of the Shrew, he puts a sailmaker in Bergamo, approximately the most landlocked city in the whole of Italy, while in The Tempest and The Two Gentlemen of Verona, he has Prospero and Valentine set sail from, respectively, Milan and Verona, even though both cities were a good two days' travel from saltwater. If he knew Venice had canals, he gave no hint of it in either of the plays he set there. And um, we got some references to language, it says, Much of the language Shakespeare used is lost to us now without external guidance. In an experiment in 2005, the Globe in London staged a production of Troilus and Cressida in early modern English, or original pronunciation. The critic John Lair, writing in The New Yorker, estimated that he could understand only about 30% of what was said. Even with modern pronunciations, meanings will often be missed. Few modern listeners would realise that in Henry V, when the French Princess Catherine mispronounces the English neck as Nick, she is perpetuated a gross, and to a Shakespearean audience, hugely comical, obscenity. Though, though Shakespeare's language on the whole was actually quite clean, indeed almost prudish. Where Ben Jonson manured his plays, as it were, with frequent interjections of turd of your teeth, shit of your head, and I fart at thee, Shakespeare's audiences had to be content with a very occasional, a pox on it, God's bread, and one horse and jackanapes. Mentions as well, though Shakespeare is frequently categorised as an Elizabethan playwright, in fact much of his greatest output was Jacobean under uh, James I. And this is great as well. <laughs> Windows admitted some light, but candles provided most of the illumination. Spectators could, for an additional fee, sit on the stage, something not permitted at the Globe, where they could show off their finery to maximum effect. The practice, though lucrative, contained an obvious risk of distraction. Stephen Greenblatt relates an occasion in which a nobleman who had secured a perch on the stage spied a friend entering across the way and strode through the performance to greet him. When rebuked by an actor for his thoughtlessness, the nobleman slapped the impertinent fellow and the audience rioted. We have a reference to what P.T. Barnum planned to do with Shakespeare's birthplace. Uh, it says, At least the birthplace escaped the fate considered for it by the empresario P.T. Barnum, who in the 1840s had the idea of shipping it to the United States, placing it on wheels, and sending it on a perpetual tour around the country, a prospect so alarming that money was swiftly raised in Britain to save the house as a museum and shrine. Thank goodness. And we get this reference to here to... Um who is it? Uh, the 17th Earl of Oxford, Edward de Vere. He's one of the people that some of these Shakespeare conspiracy theorists thinks was actually Shakespeare, and it gets um, blah blah blah. But Oxford also had shortcomings that seem not to sit well with the compassionate, steady, calm, wise voice that speaks so reliably and seductively from Shakespeare's plays. He was arrogant, petulant and spoiled, irresponsible with money, sexually dissolute, widely disliked and given to outbursts of deeply unsettling violence. At the age of 17, he murdered a household servant in a fury, but escaped punishment after a pliant jury was persuaded to rule that the servant had run onto his sword. Wow. So yes, Shakespeare by Bill Bryson. Did enjoy this a lot. I think if you're interested in Shakespeare, you're going to like it. I gave this a solid 4 out of 5 and would recommend it. So there we have it, that's what I made of Shakespeare by Bill Bryson. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.